to rethink plastic for me and make a pledge, something that you feel now inspired for your own lives that you could have picked up from just the messages in the film. And I'd like you to write it on the one side where there's a space in the middle. I'm uh, going to throw out a couple of suggestions, you know, refuse single use, uh, bring my own bag, you know, bring my own bottle, say no to straws, you know, whatever it might be, whatever you think you want to do, could you please write it down on that piece of paper, take a photograph of it and upload it to the Pink's Hug app because Plastic Oceans Foundation will make some fundraise money from each of your pictures if they're shared on social media and we receive likes. So it would mean a lot to me if you could support that and help me out. And also, it would be really good to get you thinking about how you can rethink plastic. So I want to pass you over to uh, Malcolm from Modus, who is very kindly moderating a wonderful Q&A for us this evening. So I'd like to introduce you to Malcolm. Thanks for your stand. Uh, and I'll ask now our panelists to take the stage. So just got your hands on the chairs here. And we've got one more mic. Uh, someone can grab the mic off the stand there. But also so while everyone's coming up, I'll just give us an introduction to how the session's going to go. I'll introduce our panelists first, and then start off with uh, one two-part question for each of the panelists. And then we're going to start running mics up and down the aisles, taking questions from the audience. Um, so this film has done a really amazing job in helping us understand the scale and nature of the problem and some of the most important places to focus our efforts and what some people are starting to do. So the panel up here tonight as the Q&A post screening is going to land what that means for the here and now in, in BC. So I'll just start off, I'll introduce Emma, who you, you already know, she's the executive director of Classic Oceans and uh, comes to us with about 20 years of experience in marketing and uh, PR. As well as in the UK, you've got some charity and nonprofit experience. So she's bringing that experience to start Plastic Oceans Canada, based here in Vancouver. Um, and her time in the UK and Hong Kong, living in Vancouver now, has given her a natural appreciation for the marine environment. So that's focused her efforts here. So Plastic Oceans Canada, their approach to the work is, is to bring together government, businesses, and NGOs to do a collaborative effort in order and, and to support and fund uh, education in these kind of issues. And the other thing that they're doing, obviously, as we just experienced, is using the power of film to help deepen people's thinking around this and create social change. Uh, so next up is Dr. Peter Ross. So he, I'm going to need some notes to get these organizations in. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was meant to introduce myself as well, so you did well at remembering oh, that I am. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Peter Loss uh, launched the Environmental Microplastics Facility, and that's based out of the Vancouver Aquarium's Ocean Pollution Research Program. So they're doing some world-leading research on how marine plastics get into the environment, how they move through the environment, and what impacts they have once they're in the environment. Uh, his team of seven staff and students just published the world's first report on how microplastics are affecting uh, zooplankton, which is the kind of foundation of the marine, the, er, marine food chain. Um, so he's doing some really important work helping us understand the problem and where to focus our efforts. Next is David Katz, who you may well recognize, who is in the film. Uh, so he's founder and CEO of Plastic Bank. So Plastic Bank is the organization that is uh, exchanging plastic as a currency, especially in the developing world, to help. Um, and, and in so doing, creating social plastics, which you can sell to large organizations around the world, and they buy that at a premium because it's social plastic, because of the values they're embedded in. And you translate those values back to in the pockets of the people who are out on the front lines doing this work to take the plastics out of the green environment everywhere. Next up, Andrea Reimer. She's city councilor for the uh, city of Vancouver. So Andrea is chair of the policy and strategic priorities and lead councilor for Vancouver's um, winning Greenest City Action Plan. So this has been uh, the plan that guides the city's aggressive actions on reducing environmental impact. One example of a uh, relevant example here is uh, a 23% reduction in waste in six years. So the Greenest City Action Plan. <laughs> and right now she's also providing political leadership for an upcoming answer to the Greenest City Action Plan, which is the zero waste strategy for Vancouver. Um, so that aims to move beyond just reducing impacts 
and move toward giving a framework for the city of Vancouver uh, to become a city without waste. So some bold action coming uh, and working right now. And Andrea, before politics, was executive director for the Wilderness Committee, and it was seeing you know, great work happening for protecting wilderness, um, but then feeling like it was all for naught because of the unmitigated issues that are arising from cities that drove her into politics. Great to have you. And next is Scott Fraser, president and CEO of Encore. So they are the people behind Return It, which you've probably seen ads for all over. That's um, the organization and, and the initiative that recovers beverage containers from consumers at end of life. And Corp is also responsible for end of life electronics recovery from consumers as well. And Alan, second from last year, Alan Langdon is a managing director for Multimaterials BC, also managing director for the Multimaterial Stewardship Western Program in Saskatchewan. I understand they just had their first birthday. Yep. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. um, also previously VP of Sustainability for the Retail Council of Canada and VP of Environment for the Canadian Council of Grocery Distributors. So bringing a lot of experience uh, to the issues. Multi-materials we see are the people who intervene at our homes or our businesses to divert um, you know, all materials that Shouldn't go to landfill. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, maybe that our explanation is we're Please. responsible for the... So, just because we're not responsible for business. So we're responsible for running the residential recycling business. And uh, the parallel I would draw is the, the program is referenced in Germany. That's now been in place in BC since 2014. So what started in Germany in 1992 has now made its way over to North America. Thank you so much. Yeah. Clarification. And last, but certainly not least, Harvinder, and I want to get your last name right, sorry, Ajula. Ajula? Ajula. Ajula. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. Um, so she's Information Services Manager for the Recycling Council of BC. So they're responsible for helping all of us in BC, and actually even outside of BC, understand what to do with all of these materials um, that we want to divert from landfill that are potentially recyclable. So just to give you a sense of their reach, they, in the last year, answered 230,000 questions a day. We were just talking about it. It's probably upwards of 500 questions a day in BC. So they're doing a lot of work to help us understand what to do right. So with the introductions complete, I also want to just give a quick shout out to a lot of other great organizations in the room. And I'll just run through the list very quickly here. Um, we've got Jose here from Upchires. I think Jose is over there. Uh, yeah. uh, we'll, we'll give you a moment for a round of applause. It's actually a pretty long list of amazing organizations here. Uh, Lynn from the Soap Dispensary is here. We've got, I think, Brianne and Allison from the Zero Waste Market. I was thinking about them when I saw Ask Your Grocers to Stop Carrying Packages. Um, Angie from Master Recycler Vancouver. And I believe we have Christiane from the Georgia Strait Alliance. Dana and Emily from BSR Bio and Celine from Sea Shepherd, Sean from Plastic Bank as well, and Tanya from the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. So there's a lot of people doing work on this stuff. Round of applause. Okay, I know everyone wants to go home on time, so I'm gonna move us right along to having the panel move through the first question. So it's a two-part question, uh, and it's what are you turning your attention to now on these issues? And what is holding you back most right now from doing more? Wow. Okay, so the first thing is what Plastic Oceans Foundation is doing is trying to raise awareness and create a movement of change. So we start with the film tonight and we hope to activate everyone in the room to go home, share the information with their friends and family, come back to us if you would like to work with us, and we would like, obviously, to create programs where everybody can participate. We've got a child and school ambassador program, which we would like to work on, a business ambassador program, where everybody has an opportunity to rethink their plastic usage, and we will step in to guide them and fund them with solutions that we feel we can help align with them on. And our hindrance right now is just funding. We've just incorporated, so we would obviously like to be funded. So anybody would like to fund us, we would be very, very grateful. Thank you. <laughs>
I want to just say that everybody that came here, including this panel and the ladies and gentlemen that have been just named in the audience, have all stood by you know, the Plastic Issues Foundation for the past three years while we've been building our branch, and it just means absolutely everything to me personally to have you all here. I'm sorry there's not a large enough stage or long enough in the room to, to really thank you and have you up here, but every single person is heavily and highly valued, so thank you all personally from me. Thanks, Emma, Malcolm, and everybody else. Um, I think for decades we've seen litter on the beach. Uh, we, we know what litter is. We identify with plastic bottles and plastic bags and straws. And we've seen the pictures of albatross and sea turtles mistaking plastic for food. We've been watching uh, these sorts of image, uh, you know, as children. We've, we've seen them through the 80s and 90s. We continue. Uh, whether it's with our team, with the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup, or our own mountain rescue uh, folks at the Vancouver Aquarium, uh, we've been working on the issue of entanglement of debris, of garbage, of trash that's out there that is visible. And, and many of you uh, have been dealing with cleaning up yourself, recycling, identifying, taking back to the store, trying to reuse or refuse uh, these products. For me, um, this story kind of evolved about eight or nine years ago, actually. It's probably 10 or 12 years ago, when I got a, uh, a phone call from a, a fisheries officer saying, uh, Peter, you're a federal scientist, would you serve as an expert witness uh, in support of a prosecution of a, a fishing lodge owner who had a, uh, styrofoam blocks break up into tiny little polystyrene beads that were then contaminating shoreline. And I said, I consider that, as a toxicologist, I consider that to be a structural pollutant as opposed to a chemical pollutant. And that kind of launched me down this new, new path. And uh, Malcolm uh, referred to one piece of work we did recently that found that one in every 20 zooplankton individuals in the northeastern Pacific Ocean has ingested plastic. Uh, in a similar study of seawater, we found in the Strait of Georgia, in a cubic meter of seawater, we're seeing 3,500 pieces of plastic. In Falls Creek, uh, closer to home for many of you folks, uh, we went down just to get a sample to have a look, and in a cubic meter of seawater, we counted 25,000 pieces of plastic. So these are invisible, you heard the term microplastic, invisible to the human eye, you need a microscope and some, uh, some instruments to know what you're looking at. But these do not have labels. These are the mystery pieces or shards, uh, they're fibers, they're fragments, they're, they're beads, they're pellets. Um, so understanding where they're coming from is really, really challenging. It's, it's really challenging for us in the, in the laboratory with 25,000 polymers on the market, uh, many different colors, shapes, sizes, structures, densities of these plastics. Uh, it, this is a very challenging scientific era, um, but it's through these scientific tools and good environmental study that I would argue we are going to understand where the source is, where these are coming from, how they're moving out into the environment, where the risks present themselves. And when we can backtrack the source, that's when we can talk about solutions. So we're, we're very excited right now about the challenges we face in the field of the lab. But we're going to be learning a lot more about our own behavior here uh, in British Columbia, at coastal British Columbia, um, and hopefully that will all that help us with solutions. Wow, what a good question. Uh, so much to do. You know, at the Plastic Bank, our endeavor is to do just that, to go to the tap. I always pose the riddle. If you walk in the kitchen and the sink is overflowing, in front of you, you only have a bucket, a mop, and a plunger. What do you do? What do you do first? Well, of course, the answer is always turn off the tap. And that's our endeavor. When we look at the areas in the world that are the most impoverished, they happen to be the most polluted. Those countries that have no infrastructure to collect the waste. Where you saw in the film, the waterway becomes the garbage way. Now, we continue to endeavor to create an ecosystem that allows the poor to use that plastic as a currency to monetize waste. We also heard that it's very valuable. Precisely what we do is we create the infrastructure in country that reveals the value inherent in that material, in essence, turning off the tap. Moving forward, we need to create an ecosystem 
something that connects the vulnerable economies of the world with the developing world. Where, in essence, like with Encore, you may have the opportunity here to take your recycling, take it to Encore, and then through our ecosystem, be able to deposit it into the account of an entrepreneur around the world who's then businesses to go and collect more material. We continue to endeavor to find ways to monetize that waste. Currently, we're embarking on a project backed by IBM to create a blockchain banking infrastructure for the poor where they have a sense of security, reliability, and trust, knowing that plastic itself, the very material that was contaminating their community, is now the very material that will help transcend them from poverty. A big task. Um, so Malcolm already answered the question for me, so thank you for that. Um, I, I am working on a zero waste strategy for the city of Vancouver. Um, what I thought I might do then is, is say, like, why? So as you heard, our Greenest City Action Plan has been very successful. We uh, have 23% reduction in waste over six years, so we're now, we went from just over 50% diversion to now we're coming up on 70% diversion of waste, which would be one of the highest, if not, in fact, the highest uh, rate of diversion in the developed world, which is, you know, exciting and great and awesome and actually completely insufficient for dealing with the problem of waste. If you sort of imagine a sheet of paper and you fold it in half and you fold it in half and you keep folding it in half, at some point, you cannot fold it in half again, and that's what's happening with us in, in this sort of reduction approach to waste. Um, I think of it sort of as the dress rehearsal where we learned that we could actually make a dent on waste problems, but actually now we just have to transform completely. Um, so it's exciting. I mean, there's some really exciting conversations happening. I would have loved that moment in the film where he's going and he's saying, can I get this in something other than plastic? The moment I would have loved there is for the person at the counter to go, well, actually, sir, you can't get it to go at all. And that's kind of the, the transformative change that we need to start thinking about, unless you bring your own stuff, right? I was in Vienna, um, and I had my own coffee cup. And I would go into these coffee shops. Vienna's got quite a coffee culture. Um, and people would look at me like I was kind of like a criminal for asking for it to go. Despite having my, originally I thought it was because I was like environmentally unfriendly, but no, like the act of walking with the coffee, they think like, why do you think you're so important that you need to take your coffee to go? Do you not have 10 minutes to just have it? So when you, when you think about the barriers, it's that, right? That culture shift and that, um, can we, I guess the barrier is imagination. Can we actually embrace and imagine um, a different paradigm? Understanding that there is economic activity that goes along with this, so it's not so simple as just that imagination, but then tempering in um, the economy that's going to work with this new world that comes without waste. Um, and I, I really wanted to thank um, Emma, because I know it's taken a lot of imagination and dreaming and vision and hard work to do this. And without you being able to see this movie, um, my ask to you to have an imagination around zero waste would be almost impossible. So thank you, Emma, for all your work on that. Um, our research says there are probably three or four hermits in the province who are unfamiliar with Return It, so I don't really need to talk about uh, the system that we run. But, um, the good news is, in this province, we collect 80% of all the beverage containers that are ever sold. And that's an amazing number. It ranks with the best in the world. But that is a billion containers. That means there's 250 million we don't get. 300 million of those are plastic that we do collect. There's probably close to 80 million plastic containers we'd still like to get. And the fact that you all know what we do says awareness isn't the problem. So what we're really focusing on is something that I learned from a really bright local consultant named Ruben Anderson, who said, systems determine behavior. If, you're, if you only have garbage cans in the hallway, you're telling people something about the way to behave. If there's more garbage cans than recycling bins, you're telling people something about how to behave. If garbage cans are not at the same place as recycling bins, you're telling people how to behave and they're going to use the first bin that they come to. So we're really taking a focus on 
what are the locations well, number one is people don't recycle away from home. So we've done some great partnerships, just a couple of examples. At BC Place, I'm proud to say there is now a beverage container recycling bin beside every single garbage container, which is just logical. But we started the deposit system in 1971, it's 2016. It takes a while to learn. Uh, and same thing at the p and &E. The p and &E has been an awesome partner. We doubled the collection of containers just by changing the system. Uh, so think about your system. Uh, not just about beverage containers, but I think it applies to everything that we recycle, and we do a lot with uh, Alan as well. So, we're less known than Returna. We've only been around three years, and I guess a couple questions I would ask. How many people in the room knew that the producers of packaging that were now responsible for financing the recycling system of BC? So few. And this is among the most known. So, you know, I think for what we're focused on is really on building the best recycling system, not just in Canada, not just in North America, but in the world. I think we're looking at standardizing so you can collect the same thing or put the same thing in the recycling bin everywhere. We're looking at making the system better in terms of how we manage plastics and other materials. So, for example, um, many of you, whenever I talk to people, they assume just randomly that all our plastic is going overseas, when actually all plastic collected in the residential recycling system is processed here in British Columbia, right? Um, so for us, you know, that's our focus. Can we make the system the best in the world? We think we can. Um, from there, it's how do we get at the larger problem of take oceans plastic? We know, because we also, now that we've done that, we've started to reach out to others and look at, you know, how can we address this beyond our own borders? Uh, and people always ask me, like, why? You're just a BC program. Why would you want to go beyond borders? But we, we participate in these international, um, seminars and workshops and initiatives now. And one we participate in is the um, New Plastic Economy, which is an outgrowth of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, probably the preeminent circular economy um, group in the world. And part of the reason we're doing it, and it's, it's shown in a report they published last year, we're on track now to have more plastic in the ocean than fish by 2050. Right? And when we look at the problem, it's not here in North America. We're solving the problem here in North America slowly, uh, BC first, then Canada, and then at some point we'll tackle the state's problem in four years from now. But 80% <laughs> <laughs> of the problem globally is in Asia. That's where 80% of the global leakage problem is. I think that's what you know, David's alluded to. And so we've got to take what we're learning here and the systems we're putting in place and the knowledge we have and find a way to transfer it to other jurisdictions. Uh, because we will not solve the ocean plastic here by making BC the most pristine coast and doing the things here in BC. It's going to take something that reaches out beyond our borders and works with a range of partners. And I know in dealing this, with this, and we get to work with some of the biggest companies in the world, they're scared. They're scared of what this problem is because it's going to be so hard to clean up. Uh, but we need to take action and we need to start today. So that's, for us, if, you know, one of the questions is, is there anything holding us back? There's absolutely nothing holding us back. I think we've got nothing but a sheer um, bountiful of optimism that there's a lot we can do. Uh, we've got the resources, we've got the personnel, and I think uh, really what we need right now is time and just more and more people working on it and working on it on a global basis. So at the Recycling Council, um, you know, our vision statement is a world without waste, and that's really what we're striving for. And Everybody here is probably really great at using their, their blue box for their, their recycling and the green bin for the compostables. But in terms of the, the three R's hierarchy, what we really want to do is, is go back to the top and focus on reduce. And that's where we're putting a lot of our energy right now. Is, you know, we wouldn't have these problems if you know, we weren't creating um, this waste in the, in the first place. And so, you know, we're, you know, Malcolm said we, we answered 230,000 questions. Um, Last year, you know, we'd love to answer a few more. So we always say, you know, before you toss it, you know, call us, find out if there's an alternative for it, whether it's, you know, can be reused or, or you know, find another home. Um, and the, the barrier for us really is, you know, kind of changing that mindset for folks. Everybody here is really, um, you know, really aware of, of recycling programs and maybe reducing some of your, your waste. but. You know, if you look at the number of single-use products that are out in the market now, there's more now, I think, every year than, than I've ever seen. And so, you know, can you make that switch to, you know, mesh bags at the grocery store, you know, get a, get a reusable straw, you know, um, 
instead of using disposable makeup wipes, you know, use your face cloth and, and just shifting that thinking and making that the norm um, so we don't even have these materials to, to manage at the end of the day. Okay, so now we're going to transition to our last part. And before we get into this, I just want to explain that we have a curfew to get out of here. Um, and if we don't do it, we're going to cost Plastic Oceans more money for the venue. So I'm asking for, for lots of cooperation. We've got to get out of here in about five minutes. Uh, so we're going to take two questions and two questions only. And just show of hands, who's got a burning question that they think can be a part of these two questions? Okay, we've got one up at the back. I'm just going to run the mic up. Uh, I'll, I'll just run the mic. If there was just one thing that all of us could do as we leave this room tonight, commit to do, to make a short, sudden impact, early win, what would it be? If there's one thing we can do when we leave here to make a big impact, what should we focus on? So I'll just open it up to whoever's kind of ready in the panel. We've got two mics to pass around. I was going to say, Plastic Oceans wants you to rethink plastic. That's the best way to look at this, okay? So it's not anti-plastic. We're not saying no to plastic. We're like, look at what you're going to use and look at and see whether you need to. So that's the first and the most important thing, just rethinking. If you're going to the supermarket, take your bags with you. If you're going out for a drink, refuse the straw. There are certain things, and also, you know, a lot of coffee shops, if they're going to give you a takeaway cup, they'll also give you a nice mug if you ask for it, and it's much nicer to sit and drink one of those than through those little plastic sippy cup holes that they give you to sit in their <laughs> branch and drink from. So, it's rethinking. That's the first thing. And then secondly, it'd be obviously to fund Plastic Oceans Foundation, so we can obviously do <laughs> that we want to do to help you help everyone else rethink. So that would be my answer. <laughs> I'll pass it over. Uh, very quickly, uh, for me, uh, I like to let the ocean uh, speak for itself and let the animals and the, the, the marine mammals, the fish, the seabirds, the turtles to tell us stories about the kinds of impacts and injuries they're suffering as a result of garbage, nets, entanglement, and plastic. So, so as, as, uh, as individual citizens uh, trying to figure out where these things are coming from in, 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 and how your life might be affecting the oceans, Look to the evidence, look to the numbers. The Great Canyon Shoreline Cleanup posts uh, 24 years now, I believe, worth of data on the top 10 items that are retrieved on 3,000 kilometers of shoreline uh, in Canada every year. So, you know, the, the culprits are there. Look for the evidence. We know about what the sea turtles are telling us about plastic bags. We know about packing straps that are tangling up uh, sea lines on the west coast of Vancouver Island. So look at, at your life, look at the plastic in your life. It's everywhere. You can't do everything. You don't want to just turn off the tap completely, you can't. Many of the alternatives are worse in terms of energy use, et cetera, et cetera. But we can look to the oceans and the, and the creatures living in the ocean to speak uh, about the real threats, the real problem products, the real problem uses and behaviors and items that uh, really are causing a wreaking havoc uh, in our coastal ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Plastic is remarkable. It is, in essence, a good reason why we're living as long as we're living. Plastic's fantastic, I love plastic. I just have an incredibly high regard for it. I just recognize what it takes to make. What resources, what energy has gone into give you a little disposable lid. A stir stick which you use for a moment. Look at it all and recognize how valuable it is. Don't waste it. Don't think that it's free. Because it's not. Um, so I'm struggling with this. Choose one thing. Um, because it's such a mass an activist at heart, a community organizer, send me an email or go to vancouver.ca and put zero waste in the in the little Google bar and sign up to be on that list so that when the policy comes to council, you can help mobilize people to come out. If you're really kind of policy wonky and into regulations and stuff, these guys are your guys because the <laughs> regulations that they deal with are complex and quite fascinating, but not for everyone. Um, and of course, the <laughs> Recyclopedia um, that the Recycling Council of BC does is an incredible resource. So if you're the kind of person that people come to to say, I have this 
this thing, but I don't know what to do with it, or I'm moving and I've got all these piles, and what happens? They're your, your person. So, and, and then, as I said, imagination is really the barrier here. So the more you can think of and share it, um, the more we'll move quickly on solving this problem. And since, in a sense, uh, Councillor, yeah? I'm just going to see one of these mics to reduce our uh, feedback problem. Um, uh, Councillor Reimer actually stole my idea about communication. I'm going to toss it back at her which is um, I am involved uh, on the uh, Zero Waste Committee. The City of Vancouver, and I'm going to not get the name right, the City of Vancouver has an amazing uh, survey that they do. You sign up for it and they engage with citizens to express opinions and uh, I'm getting them. Talk Vancouver, thank you. And uh, if you're not on Talk Vancouver and you want to get your voice on zero waste or a lot of other issues, Talk Vancouver, I highly encourage it, um, and you'll learn a lot in the process, really get engaged. So I'm going to try and give a non, I'm kind of almost hurt, but I was called a wonky or a policy driven person, so I'm going to give a very non wonky answer, which is, if you want to use it, and we can recycle it. The, you know, what's really up to you is, do you need to use it? So that's really your choice. Do you need to use that or do not? If you don't, we can recycle it, but really the choice is, do you need it or not? I like that answer too. Um, there's a campaign in October every year called National Waste Reduction Week in October and we always ask people to make a commitment for Waste Reduction Week and then we ask them to carry that forward throughout the year. We make every week Waste Reduction Week. And a, a fun thing that we do with kids is you get them to tie a, a plastic bag, which I well, might have to change that, but you tie it on their belt loop. The parents don't like this, but it, it's really valuable for, you know, and then all day long they put their garbage in this, in this bag that is tied to their belt loop. Um, and even if you think you're not making a lot of garbage, if you have to wear your garbage, um, you realize you make a lot of garbage. And then people ask you, why are you walking around with garbage? And then you have to tell them and you, and you spread the word. So I would say, you know, um, I can imp everybody can make an improvement. So pick one thing um, that you know that maybe you could do better on and make that a commitment. You know, do it two days out of the seven and then do it four and then do it for seven out of seven and then do it for another week do it for another week, and that's how you create long-term change. Awesome, thank you. Everyone, we've reached time, but I want to uh, just draw your attention before you go to, uh, you may have already seen or you will see an email in your inbox. That's got a handout that Emma slaved over, um, and all the information for all the organizations that we've just uh, talked to, so hopefully we've whet your appetite. Look there and get engaged for more information. Thank you everyone for coming.